Good morning. Welcome to SUNUP. I'm Austin Moore. Today we begin with a question from Facebook where a viewer recently asked if the drought had contributed to an increase in sandburrs. For the answer, we turn to SUNUP's resident weed expert, Angela Post. Sandburr does have some drought tolerance, so it's going to continue. You know, last year in our drought and the year before, we still had sandburr seed production in those years, whereas some of our other weeds maybe didn't quite make it. Um, so we still have additions to the seed bank during those two years, and that's going to hit us hard this year. Post says the first line of defense is proper fertility, correct pH, and avoiding overgrazing. Also important, dormant season tillage and controlled burns. What that does is actually stimulate germination of sandbur. So it will destroy some seed, but uh, what we really want to do is stimulate germination of a lot of the seed bank at one time, and that way we can come back in with a post-emergent application and control that more effectively and get more of that out of the seed bank. So in pasture and range, we really only have four labeled products in, for sandbur control. Our pre-emergent product, which is a perfect time to put that down right now, is Prowl and that would go out um, right, and that's going to um, control any sandbur that has not emerged. It will not control emerged sandbur. So if you have areas of bare ground where sandbur has already come up, that's not going to be an effective product for you. Uh, for post-emergent uh, timing, we have three products labeled. Um, one of those is uh, glyphosate. That's going to be put out at 11 ounces per acre, and you typically want to apply that um, after the first hay cutting and then you're going to have a 28-day grazing restriction or a haying restriction on that. The other two products are uh, Pastora and Plateau, and Pastora goes out at one to one and a half ounces per acre, and that product is going to have a longer um, grazing and haying restriction, and it also can go out now uh, or just after um, emergence of sand burr when they're one to one and a half inches tall, and also can go out after the first hay cutting. And our final product is Plateau. It's not used as often. It is quite effective for sand burr, but it does tend to set our Bermuda grass back by 30 to 45 days. So uh, we can have a decrease in forage with use of Plateau. That one goes out at 4 to 12 ounces per acre. Post also gave us an update on weeds in wheat and canola. So right now in wheat, um, many parts of Oklahoma have already um, started to see first hollow, t hollow stem and jointing, and so that's a, a a prime time where we need to stop some of our ALS herbicide applications for grass weeds so that we don't uh, cause injury to our wheat harvest. So we do have several broadleaf products that are still um, available that you can apply up uh, through the boot stage and those would include things like Bucterol, uh, Stinger, and Harmony and those are going to be more effective for your broadleaf weed control. Uh, for grass weeds we really are um, left at this point if you're past jointing with Axial, and that would be effective for Italian ryegrass if you're struggling with that still. Right now in canola, I, I'm struggling mostly with broad leaves, and um, you have time, obviously, to get uh, an additional Roundup applications out. Many people are going out right now with a Roundup application um, if you have Roundup ready canola. In conventional canola, the um, only real product you have available for broad leaves is going to be Stinger and um, it should be effective on many of those broadleafs just use an appropriate surfactant and appropriate amounts of AMS um, if you're going to be going out with that now. If you'd like to learn more about weeds and weed control, you'll find a link to post weed science page on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Joining us once again is Kim Anderson, our grain marketing specialist. Kim, this year producers are facing a lot of volatility, both in price and production. Let's start out talking about price and what we've seen in the market. Well, let's go back to February the 3rd. The Kansas City Board of Trade July wheat contract price was $6. By March the 20th, that price had increased to $7.82, a $1.82 price increase. Now, some producers forward contracted wheat in early February, and they gave up that opportunity to get that additional $1.82. Now, if you look at it, with 32 bushel wheat, that's $58 an acre, or for a section of land, 640 acres of wheat, that's over $37,000 they gave up. Now. Since uh, then, uh, the last week and a half, prices have fallen off about 40, 40 cents a bushel. That's about $13 an acre decline in value, 
or about $8,200 loss in value per an acre of wheat over the last week and a half. So that is a lot of volatility in price. Let's talk about how production plays into that. Well, in a normal year, if production's up, then price is down. If, if production's down, price is up. So you get some offset between the production risk and the price risk, but not this year in some areas. You take southwestern Oklahoma, western Kansas, the Texas Panhandle, where they have poor production. If we can get good production in other areas, you're not going to have that price production in interaction. Those producers in the extreme drought areas are facing both production risk and price risk. Now some producers in the, in, uh, the other areas, they may have some offsetting uh, factors there between production, but there's more risk in the drought areas than there is non-drought areas. Okay, so producers in those drought areas, how do they go about selling wheat then? Well, I think all the producers have to have a mechanical strategy. I think they've got to have it written down. I think it's got to be mechanical because you've got to take all the emotion out of when do I sell my wheat. All right. And if you'd like to learn how to create that kind of plan, go to our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and look under show links for a fact sheet. I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. Dry lines in Oklahoma are common for us. An interesting feature from the Mesonet National Dew Point Temperature Map on Wednesday at 5 p.m. was how a dry line extended from South Texas up past Oklahoma, then across Kansas, Northern Missouri, Illinois, and Indiana. The biggest variation in dew point temperatures Wednesday evening was in Oklahoma. Slapout had a 5 degree dew point. 40 miles east in Woodward, the dew point was 47. In the eastern part of the state, dew points were in the mid 60s. And yes, we had a tornado watch across north central Oklahoma. Seven counties had county burn bans active on April 2nd. They were scattered across the state. Plan available water varied widely across Oklahoma from east to west on April 2nd. The eastern side of the state came in with close to four or more inches in the top 16 inches of soil, the dark green areas. Out west in the brown map areas, plan available water in the top 16 inches was extremely low, an inch or less. Here's Gary with a look at our latest drought status. Let's start out with a look at the latest U.S. Drought Monitor map. Well, another dry, windy week gets us another large drought expansion. This time we saw severe drought expand across central into north central Oklahoma, uh, basically due to reports of uh, fires, lots of wildfires have been going on, ailing wheat, wheat has started to go downhill a little bit, as many of you know, and also farm ponds, we're getting reports of those starting to dry up again across that area, so we've switched uh, from uh, moderate drought to severe drought in that area. Now it's easy to see why when you look at these Mesonet rainfall maps for January 1st through April 2nd, you can see that the southwest northeast gradient there, where the northwestern half of the state has basically received less than two inches of rainfall, and in actuality a lot of that area has received less than one inch. We can see less than 20% of normal uh, for a lot of that area. Now some of it's less than 40% of normal, but still we saw a statewide average for that uh, basically three month period of about 2.6 inches, which sounds okay, but actually that's you know about four inches below normal. And if you look at the historical rankings for that time period, that's the fifth driest such period on record. So. Um, a really unfortunate start to the year to have one of the fifth driest starts again. Uh, continuation of drought and as we look at the U.S. monthly drought outlook, well we still see basically the western half to maybe uh, three-fifths of the state covered by drought still. Uh, that drought is expected to persist or even intensify. Now at least that drought over in the, the eastern uh, third or so of the state is expected to uh, actually be completely removed. So that's good news for the eastern parts of the state. So again, hopefully uh, as you are watching this, it's raining in your area or you've gotten some rain to help out these drought conditions. Uh, and again, without 
uh, the worst effects of the severe weather. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. What a difference a year makes. It seems like last year we were in canola fields and there was a little more yellow to it. And we have Josh Bouchon here to talk about, Josh, where is the yellow in the, in the canola fields this year? It's, it'll be here. It'll Just will. give it a little bit more time. Uh, we are behind schedule. Uh, typically we are blooming right now. Uh, we're maybe two to three weeks behind schedule according to the last few years. Uh, but about 10 years ago, this is about where we were, but last three or four years, we've been going earlier and earlier, but this year we're delayed a little bit again. So hopefully we'll have some continued cooler days during pod fill and stuff like that. Hopefully it doesn't get hot too quick and hopefully we stay clear of some of those late spring freezes as well. So, but for the most part, we're looking good. We have potential out there. We've got some excellent fields still. Uh, we've lost a few here and there uh, due to the prolonged harsh winter we've had. So, uh, but for the most part, guys are pretty pleased with the crop right now. Okay, so, and, and of course, moisture, moisture, moisture. We can, we can never have too much rain. Well, you can, but you probably yeah. won't right now. A lot of guys are getting very dry right now, mm -hmm. to say the least. So we really need another rain to kind of set these yields. Uh, like I said, we're sitting more or less dormant, starting to break dormancy, going into bolting. We really need another good rain to really set some good yields. So. Okay. Now, what what should producers be looking for in their fields right now? Because we're we're, we're kind of past the, uh, the the spraying period. Yes. Once the canola starts to bolt, you've kind of exceeded or went past the deadline for putting herbicides out. Mm -hmm. But we still need to go out and scout our fields. We usually start seeing a lot more insect damage this year or this time of year. So we get out and check for worms, uh, your army cut worms, your diamondback moth larva. Uh, as we get closer to harvest, variegated cut worms. Uh, but for the most part, aphids have been our biggest issue. Uh, so get on top of those if we need to. Uh, and as we get closer to harvest, maybe false chinch bugs and uh, a few other insects like that. So keep an eye out for insects. Uh, sometimes we start seeing a little bit of disease pressure this time of year, but if it was more or less came in in the spring, we usually don't see a big uh, advantage of putting any fungicides out this time of year. Usually we see our impact from the fungicides if we have onset in the fall. So uh, sometimes we see some symptomology here and there from some diseases like black leg or black rot or even some sclerotini or, or white mold. So, uh, but for the most part, we haven't had any big issues with diseases coming in the spring. So cross our fingers at least. Right, and, and producers will have an opportunity to, to meet up with you across the state. You guys are, are tour in the state talking canola. Yep, we're going to go from corner to corner of the state again. Uh, we're going to start off April 14th through the 17th. Uh, we got about 15 stops planned for the tours. Uh, contact your local county agent. He'll know where the closest one is. We don't have them in every county, but uh, usually they're within driving distance if producers want to go out and look at some canola. We have several speakers, tentative plan to speak at each stop. Anything from uh, basic agronomics, or agronomics uh, best management practices, you got fertility, weed control, diseases, insects. Uh, so there's a big gamut of different topics that we can discuss, but we usually have plenty of time for discussion with the producers. Kind of walk through what they've been seeing this year and what they uh, maybe should have done or done differently. So it's always a learning process. We've been growing it for a decade now and we're still learning quite a bit each year. So. Uh, but it is a great opportunity to get out and look at some canola and learn a few things. Okay, Josh Bouchon, thank you much. We'll put a link to that on our website, sunup.okstate.edu. Joining us once again is Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist. Daryl, take us through the recent weeks in terms of box beef and fed cattle. You know, box beef has been an absolute roller coaster this year. In January, we had a big run up, unexpected to high level, set a new record. It came back down fairly dramatically in February, uh, but then in March, we saw it run up to an even higher level, which has now peaked. It looks like we're working our way down from there. It's dropped quite a bit just in the last few days. And, you know, so that, that raises a question of where is it going to go down to and sort of what's ahead in terms of both price level and maybe more importantly, the price volatility. It's been an absolute roller coaster in this market. Fed cattle prices kind of followed the same thing 
thing a little bit less dramatically. Uh, they peaked in January, backed off a bit in February. They're running really strong right now, probably have peaked uh, or are, you know, are at the peak at this point, and they will begin to work their way modestly lower through April. Uh, you know, we're moving into, uh, you know, through April into May and June will be the peak in fed cattle marketings and cattle slaughter seasonally. So, they'll, you know, these, we would expect these markets to, to come down a little bit seasonally uh, with, with that kind of, uh, you know, supply change uh, through, through the next couple of months. All right, so what about feeder cattle? Through this whole process, really going back to last fall, feeder cattle prices have been very high. We've moved a little bit higher, and we're you know we're at record levels with feeder cattle prices. Not in, not anywhere near the kind of volatility that those those uh, other markets have displayed. Um, feeder cattle prices, you know, seasonally should continue to grind a little bit higher into midsummer. Uh, that may or may not happen. It probably depends as much as anything on moisture conditions as we go forward. But one of the things you have now is with these strong feeder cattle or fed cattle prices, uh, you've got a lot of justification, if you will, in the short run here for these feeder cattle prices to stay pretty stable and to be supported at the levels they're at. All right, now things are starting to green up around us here. How are things looking for producers as we head into spring? You know, spring has been late in coming in terms of temperature more than anything. Uh, it's been cold until very recently. Looks like it's beginning to happen. I think in Oklahoma and really around the country, we have producers in kind of three categories. We've got producers in a, in a situation where they've got quite a lot of moisture. Uh, they can move forward with their sort of normal plans. If they're in herd expansion mode, at this point in time, those can move forward. Later on, they certainly have to pay attention to weather conditions, but they're off to a good start. We've got another group of producers that have just sort of barely adequate moisture at this point in time. They're going to go one way or the other. They're kind of teetering on the edge of either getting better or getting worse. And those producers really have to be nimble and light on their feet in the next few weeks, watching the weather and being prepared to either move forward aggressively if they get an opportunity or to retrench and take some defensive measures if they continue to get dry. The last category of those producers in parts of Oklahoma and again in parts of the country that have really never been out of the drought for the last uh, three years or so, in most cases those producers have already made the kind of adjustments that they can maintain at this point. Uh, so they're just watching to see when conditions do improve and they can sort of get back and, 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 and move forward but probably don't face any imminent decisions in terms of certainly not getting worse in most cases. Uh, it's just looking for an opportunity to get better. All right, plenty to think about. Daryl Peel, Livestock and Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. Here in the Southern Plains, we have quite a percentage of the cow herds that calve in the fall. They calve in the months of September and October. That brings about a real decision when we get into springtime as to when we wean those fall-born calves. Traditionally, spring calving operations will wean at about seven to eight months of age. But some of the fall herds have found success by waiting until those calves are older, nine to ten months of age, and not weaning until, say, June or July. Well, here at Oklahoma State University, we've conducted experiments looking at comparing the weaning times of fall calving cows. You see, they took 158 Angus cows over a four-year period of time and weaned half of them in April when the calves were only about seven months of age. The other half they left on the cows until they were about 10 months of age and they were weaned in July. Then they could take a look to see how the calves performed as well as how the cows performed the following year when the next breeding season came around. <clears throat> what they found was that if the cows were in that young group, the two and three year olds, the April weaning gave them a real advantage over their counterparts that were weaned in July. To the tune of about a nine, to almost 10% increase in rebreeding rates. When they looked at the older cows, those that had had calves before, they were four years old and up, there was no real advantage in terms of rebreeding percentage by weaning the calves earlier. Now, when you look at calf weight, you would expect there to be a sizable difference in the weaning weights of calves that were weaned much later. And in fact, in this case, 204 pounds was the average difference between the July weaned calves and the April weaned calves. Now, the April weaned calves, of course, as they got older and just were put out on pasture, caught up some but they were still 40 to 50 pounds lighter than if they stayed with their mamas. So as we look over this data, I think we can glean from it that there might be some advantage 
to early weaning, weaning in April, real young cows, two and three year olds, and letting their calves just grow uh, through the, the uh, first half of, of summer and uh, be comparable then in terms of the, the weaning weights of those that would stay on the cow. With older cows, we saw no real advantage in terms of the April weaning. Letting those calves stay on that mother cow until they were nine to 10 months of age worked out real well. The calves were bigger, the cows rebred just as well. So we, I think we can take a look at this data and make some decisions about how we might want to handle the weaning times of the cows in our herd this year. And we look forward to visiting with you again next week on Sunup's Cow Calf Corner. Joining us now is Gant Maurer, our beef value added specialist, to talk about the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network program. And Gant, we had lots of sales this last fall, and you and the team have been running the numbers. What's this past season look like? You know, we really had a, had a great year in, in 2013, and, and again, most of our sales are in the fall. Um, and so last fall, it was the, the second highest um, year in terms of, of enrollments, of cattle enrollments that we've had, um, with about 5,400 head enrolled uh, last fall in the OQBN VAC 45 program. Let's talk about the premiums from this year's sale. Yeah, Lindell, we, uh, we had another uh, good year like we did last year. Our overall premium um, was $8.65 a hundredweight um, for, for calves that were, that were weaned versus a non-weaned calf going through the livestock auction market. Now, when we break that out a little bit further um, by weight class, the, the lighter weight calves that were between three to 400 weight calves, um, we saw record high premiums um, being anywhere from 20 to $25 a hundred weight premium for those calves. And then it tapers off, it, it goes down as those calves get heavier. And, and the, still the heavy weight calves, seven and a half to eight weight calves, we still saw a, a six to, to $7 a hundred weight premium for those calves, which if you kind of think about it, you, you would expect that because the longer the those, the, you own those calves and the longer they're alive, the healthier they are and not as much risk involved with those cattle. Talk about the value of gain and what that's been looking like. Yeah, well the, still uh, one of the most profitable things a producer can do is retain ownership of his calves, um, especially through a 45 day or a 60 day weaning period. Um, that value of gain has been well over a dollar and, uh, and, and typically uh, many producers can precondition a calf. Um, for less than than a dollar to, to 80 cents a day um, pretty economically so so that extra time that we retain ownership of those calves is, is 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 very valuable to a producer in fact when we run the numbers if we can only put one pound of gain on those calves it equaled about 54 dollars a head profit um, and that's a net profit for those producers that went through that preconditioning process and would you say consistency is the key to success in these value-added programs absolutely uh, if, if whether you're involved in, in a program like this or not, the consistency year after year, marketing uh, um, your calf crop or your product to one specific buyer, that's important. So they know when they come back to you what type of product they're purchasing, um, know what type of calves they're purchasing, how they perform in, in the feedlot, um, and, and know that they're going to be healthy and, and do well on into the feedlot. So year after year, we need to we need to make those breeding and management decisions so we can so we can have that product to market. Gant Maurer, thanks a lot, great information. And for more on the Oklahoma Quality Beef Network, just go to sunup.okstate.edu. Hi. Welcome to Shop Stop. Today we want to talk about it using multimeters and uh, all the different settings. Okay, so you've got this multimeter here and you've got all these different things on there that you can switch to. How would I know if it was AC? It would be this squiggly line. Yes. And that's called, it, that's a sign. It's going for, it's alternating current. And the uh, DC voltage would typically have a solid line with a dashed line under it. Uh, the millivolts is, uh, is similar as well, so it would have the, the small M and the V. 
if you're looking on, on uh, most equipment, you're talking about DC voltage, so you're looking at 12 volts. Again, you got a, you got a common uh, lead and, and then for your hot as well for your voltage. So you would just touch these to wherever you're looking for your voltage. Uh, so very similar to what you would get out of a test light when you're looking at voltage, except for you're going to actually see the value as opposed to the light lighting up. Usually if you're going to do a continuity check, it'll be something that's going to have a, a sound on it as well. So if we took that and put that on sound and we were going to check continuity. Resistance would be the uh, upside down horseshoe that's on there for ohms. You can do a diode check, which is this one right here, which you have uh, uh, current flow one way but not the other. You got amperage that you can check both, uh, both DC and, uh, and AC amperage as well. You, one of those you need to watch out for though because if you overamp this thing you'll you'll burn this fuse out and you'll have to replace it. Yeah. And definitely uh, if you look at, at where your uh, where your leads are connected in you'll need to know where you're going to connect those for the, the amperage on one side and, and voltage resistance continuity on the other where the the commons would stay in the center all the time. You can pick these up uh, about any store a hardware store and they'll you, their prices are our broad range. You can go from extremely less expensive, I mean real cheap, to as much as you want to pay for one. So, you know, if you're looking for one and you're just going to be doing stuff around the shop or house, why, you know, you don't need a real expensive meter. So, just a few tips on uh, using a multimeter. We'll see you next week on Shop Stop. That'll wrap us up for this week. As always, you can see clips from this show on our YouTube channel and our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and be sure to follow us on social media. For all of us here at SunUp, have a great week, and we'll see you next time.